in our uh, workshop. I'm very glad that we have uh, Jane Ginsburg here. Uh, she, she will talk about uh, publishing and how to successfully publish. And uh, it's a great honor for our Institute of Psychology to have, uh, to have her here and to have Blanca, who, who is uh, the main person uh, or in organizing uh, this lovely conference. Institute is one of the institutions involved. And uh, we are all very happy about it. And uh, feel, please feel uh, free to ask questions uh, after the uh, workshop or during and enjoy. Thank you very much indeed. Would you like to come and sit yes, down and make yourself comfortable? You. I'm planning for this to be really <laughs> informal. And I hope that you will speak as much as I do. I actually have prepared very little to say to you because what I want to do is to share experiences and for you to be able to ask questions. I may not be able to answer them all, but I will do my best. I was very much hoping that Richard Palmcutt might come to join us because he also has experience as an editor. Um, but I think what would be helpful for me to know is how many of you here um, have already published in, um, in a peer-reviewed journal? One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, that's fantastic. So I will be calling on you for your experiences. How many of you are students? So one, two, three, four, five, six, or something like that. And so your PhD students? Yes. yes. So you will be publishing. Okay. Right. Okay. So I'm going to begin, actually, by doing um, a little plug for ESCOM. How many of you have heard of ESCOM? I hope all of you have, because ESCOM, the European Society for the Cognitive Sciences of Music, is actually supporting this conference. Um, and so you should have read about it um, on the website. And here is Richard, um, who <laughs> was the president of ESCOM until uh, 2018. And Renee Timmers, I think, is probably not going to be joining us, but she is the current president. And John was the first president, so you've got all of the presidents of ESCOM here. Yeah. And actually, it's quite it's a coup, cool, Blanca, to get all four of us together. We've had three of us together at the conference that Anna was at in Katowice last year. And we have to organize a few more of these first conferences of what we think of as regional societies, but which is your national society. Okay, so the other thing is that I am the current editor-in-chief of Music SGNCA, and the last time I gave a, a workshop like this, the first comment that somebody made was, at last, a definitive way of saying it because you can call it Music ICNCI, you can call it, I don't know, you can call it whatever you like, but um, the, the editor's tradition is to call it Music SDMCA. Whether that is correct Latin or not, who knows. So the plug begins with, with the ESCOM website. It's just as well, given the drama we had making the projector work, but I didn't say I want to do this with live internet and taking you to the actual website. So I've done it with screenshots. But if you go to the website, it will look something like this. And so it's got Music is the NCA a little bit, about halfway down it. And if you follow through, you will see all of the conferences and save the date for the one in Sheffield in 2021. I hope some of you will come to that. And actually, if we go down a little bit further, you'll see this very conference is at the top of the list. So what ESCOM does is to promote the sharing of research, 
in music psychology and music cognition. I've forgotten what's on my next slide. It's the why become a member of ESCOM. Well, the great thing is that you're supporting and you're being seen to support our discipline. You get paper copies as well as you become a member of this group of international researchers. You get four hard copies of Music is MCA a year. You get online access through the website. You get society discounts for registering at ESCOM events. And you can even become a member of the committee and actually have some say in how the society works for all of its members. You can be a full member. You can be a student member at vastly reduced rates. And then there are, you, you probably don't want to be a sustaining member, and your institution might want to be a member. And there are, oh, Richard, can I say please. <laughs> um, uh, you can get electronic subscription, which is cheaper, and also Eastern Europeans are paying less, isn't that right? It says living, working in a financially disadvantaged well, country. We, this includes and this includes Eastern Europe, I think it's which is you. Is there anybody, Blanca? You're a member of ESCOM, aren't you? Yes. So, of course. So you have the discounts. Uh, but uh, just to inform you, it will be go email with that, yes. that yes. information. The, it already yes. came. Yes. Yes. Oh, very good. All yes. right. In fact, uh, for uh, participants of the conference, uh, students, uh, it's free. They just have to apply on registration notes. Good. So that's wonderful. And so we hope that there will be lots more members of ESCOM by the end of this conference. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so publishing in journals, what journals are there? I've given you on this slide just a few examples. In Britain, our National Society predates ESCOM, and it's the Society for Education, Music and Psychology Research, and it's known as SEMPRE, and it publishes Psychology of Music. Psychomusicology, I can't, I'm just having one of those moments, I can't remember whether it's psychomusicology or music perception, that's attached to the Society for Music Cognition. Oh. It's psychomusicology. It's Psychomusicology is an APA journal. It's the APA it's journal. Music perception is SMPC. Okay. But it's not so, really, really SMPC, actually. It's, it's the University of California Press. It's actually independent. Yeah. So we have the two American ones. That's the way I think of them. <laughs> we have the British one. <laughs> and we have Music as NCA. And we have an annual special issue, so which is edited not by me, but by guest editors. So there are three of these that I'm responsible for, and one special issue um, where there will be guest editors actually working with me. But there are lots of other journals. So there's the British Journal of Music Education and the International Journal of Music Education if you are in music education, and there's music education research. And then if you are more in music than in psychology, there's the Journal of New Music Research. Then there are the online journals. So there's the journal that I edited for about 10 years, Music Performance Research. And there is the Journal of Interdisciplinary Studies in Music, which is the journal of the Society for Interdisciplinary Studies in Music, and Richard is the editor. So, what have I missed out? There is Empirical Music Review, of which René is an editor. So, there are lots of journals, and one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit further down the line, a little bit later on in this talk, is how do you choose the most appropriate journal to submit your manuscript to? So, this is where I really want to ask you a question, and that's why do you read journal articles? Is there anybody here who hasn't read a journal article? No. Well, the last time I, I did a workshop like this, there were undergraduates, 
and they hadn't necessarily read a journal article. So you've all read journal articles. Why do you read journal articles? We need it for the information and what is going on in, in other, our area. So we, we read for information. We need to get, know what's going on in our field. Okay, how do we choose what to read? Keywords. Keywords. So if you're searching for something, you'll, 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 put, search, you'll put keywords into a search engine. Yeah. As a matter of interest, what search engines do you use? Here we have uh, some uh, faculty, uh, no, university network, and we have access to many uh, uh, international journals. This is one, and the Google School, Scholar is uh, the other one, I think. And we have some domestic, but we are more oriented towards international journals. And I think, uh, if, if, if you hadn't said Google Scholar, for all its faults, for all Google's faults, Google Scholar is, is an invaluable resource, I think, for us, and it's where I send students first. If you publish your own research or you post your own research, if you make use of ResearchGate and academia.edu, and I have to say I don't pay for any of the premium ones, I just use the basic ones, if you're plugged into that, that can also be a good way of getting access to other people's journals. But let's look down my list. I mean, I've, my, I've, I've, I've made a list, and it's, as you said, Anna, it's to get information to find out what's going on. It's really to discover other people's research. What are other people doing? To learn more, as you said, about a particular field to explore the literature in a particular field and identify the gaps. Those of you who are writing PhD theses, I don't know what your definition of research is in this country. We have, um, we have a definition that we have to use for our annual, um, it's not annual, it takes place every five years, our assessment of research in Britain. It's called the Research Excellence Framework. It used to be called the Research um, Academic the RAE. Do you know, I've just forgotten what the RAE was. Isn't that lovely? But we now call it the Research Excellence Framework. And um, the definition is new insights effectively shared. So it's very much about finding the gaps in the literature. You have to be original. To find out about different research methods. It's not just about finding out about findings, is it? It's also to find out how people did the research. Maybe to identify potential models for your own research. It's not just what you could do, or what you could do, and how you can do it. But it's also how you can report it. Mm -hmm. Now, that's my list. Is there anything I've missed out? To find people to cooperate with them, also thanks to the articles. That's a really good point. To find out who you might collaborate with. That's a really good point. I was thinking as an editor, I will sometimes read a paper thinking maybe the author could review for me. Maybe that's an appropriate, maybe, maybe they'd be a, a good person to read a paper that I'm considering. So that's about why you read journal articles. Now what about why do we, why do we write articles? Why do we write them and submit them to journals? I mean, the obvious answer is we have to. We're expected to. I mean, you know, the, the research excellence framework works, it used to work on the basis that every academic had to, had to show that they had published something that was world class or international class or at least national, of national importance um, for items over the last five years. 
Um, that's now changed, and so it's got to be an average, it's got to be over everybody in a department or in a faculty. So, in some ways, we are expected to write journal articles, and that may be on my list. But actually, that's not the most important reason. So why would we do it? If we didn't have to do it, why would we write, why would we write articles? To share our ideas, our findings. Exactly. To yeah. share our yeah. findings and our methods. Yeah. yeah. And to get feedback yeah. from other people. What else? Should we look down my list? I have an idea. Yes, Richard. I think some people in this room want to get a job in academia. Is that right? So it's like your calling card, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you, Richard. My pleasure. So before publication, to get feedback on your research, I said that. Oh, and that's all. But also to get feedback on the way that it's been reported. Okay, but yes, because you're not going to get a job if you don't have publications. So now, what does the process involve? I didn't ask, actually. Um, who else is an editor here, besides Richard and myself? Does anybody else edit a journal? I think it's important, but it wasn't very scientific uh, journal, but it was for the new teachers, but also with the practical uh, aspects. Right. So that's so, please, share your experiences. Oh. Was it a peer review journal who sent articles out to review? Yes, we had review, but it wasn't uh, anonymous. It, it, it wasn't but very, not, but not through the double blind process. Okay. So the first thing you have to do to get published is very obvious. You have to do the research. You, it's very, very rare to publish a work in progress. You want it finished in order to be able to report it. In that way, it's a little bit different from giving a conference paper where you can report preliminary results. Though actually, I'm going to just go back on that and say, if you are involved in a long program of research, you may publish one stage, and then the next stage, and then the next stage. And I don't know how many of you will be at my talk tomorrow, but I will describe some of my own research that has appeared in that way. Ideally, though, you will present your research at a conference so that you can get feedback. People will ask you questions. You'll realise what you've forgotten about, what you didn't make clear. And there will be suggestions as to ways in which you could, if not improve on the research, then maybe improve on the reporting, or maybe to do a different analysis or an additional analysis. So it's really helpful to do that. But then the next stage is to identify the appropriate journal. Now, of the people who have submitted published articles in peer-reviewed journals, how did you decide which journal to go for? You think back to your last publication. How did you decide? You can look at where authors in, in your field have published their own stuff, and you can try and follow that. And I think that's a really important point, and it's, it's when I'm asked, where shall I publish such and such, I say, well, where are the people that you've cited? Where are the people who are in your reference list? Where have they published? Because those journals may be interested in what you have to say. So that's a really good suggestion. What else? What else might you do? Maybe some, uh, of course, relevant uh, to your work and to your field, but uh, maybe with some colleagues uh, that they already published in the journal and have experience with the whole process, that is also good idea, I think. I think that's right. So mm -hmm. it may be that if you're, if you're collaborating with other researchers, and, and I'm just thinking, I used to, I, did a, I was involved in a research project for quite a long time with a colleague in the Department of Acoustics at another university. 
And so a lot of our papers started appearing in acoustics journals where I would, I would, I would be sending to psychology journals and then with a slightly different slant it would go to a journal of acoustics. Some current research I'm doing on the musician's health and well-being involves research on hearing. Some of that is appearing in the Journal of Hearing. So there are, there, there, it may be that if you are in a team, people have different expertise, different experience, and, um, and different contacts with different journals. So that's a very good point. You know, something I didn't ask but would be of interest to me, I know that this meeting is taking place in the Faculty of Psychology, am I right? But how many of you are in music rather than in psychology? I know Blanca is. So just a handful of you are predominantly in music. Great. And the rest of you are in psychology. Good. That's right. I saw when you, the two of you came in, I was told, we have a musician and we have a psychologist working together. So uh, there, there are sometimes calls for papers Sometimes they come out of a conference and then will be proposed as a special issue. Music as the NCA is not the only journal that um, has special issues. And Richard, would you like to say something about interdisciplinary um, music studies? Because you've certainly yeah. published papers from conference, conferences. Yeah, um, can I just answer this question first? I just Please. want to say something about identifying the appropriate journal. So um, one... One option is to make a list of journals that you think are appropriate and um, try and work out how hard it's going to be, right? So sometimes that's the impact factor, or sometimes you already have an impression, oh, this is an important journal, and you think they're going to reject, right? So you think, oh, this journal is too important for me, they might reject it. So I, I think the best policy is to go a little bit higher than what you think you can do, right? So start with a journal that you think, well, maybe they're, they're probably going to reject, or 50% they're going to reject, and then you send it to them. And when they do reject, hopefully they'll give you all these great comments, which and they give it to you for free, right? I mean, this is like a wonderful service. So when you get the rejection, you think, wow, that was like, how much is that worth? A thousand euros worth of comments they've sent me, and then they've rejected my paper, right? And after that, you fix it and send it to the next one on the list. I think that's a brilliant suggestion. <laughs> it's also brilliant because it gets you into the mindset that being rejected is not a form of failure. That actually, if you're thinking, I want this paper to be rejected, but I'm going to get the great feedback. Actually, in my experience, you can have you can have the experience of not getting the feedback because it doesn't get sent. Your paper doesn't get sent out to review, but then you chalk that up to experience as well, and then you 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 send to the next one on your list. Does that sound all right, Richard? I think that's what I will do. <laughs> in fact, I did it recently. I had a paper which was rejected by seven different journals. I had, I had a list of them seven. And then it's, it's now published in a good journal. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. You um, know, I'm thinking about very famous authors who paper their lavatories with their copies of their rejection letters. You know, J.K. Rowling, who wrote Harry Potter. Harry Potter was rejected by, I don't remember, 32, 36 yeah. publishers. <laughs> yes, really. So it's one of those really lovely stories. Um, and you just, you just have to think, well, I grew up in Scotland where we are told the story of Robert the Bruce and the spider. And Robert the Bruce was inspired by a spider who was trying to start a web and kept hurling itself across the room to start the web and kept missing, falling on the floor, picking itself up, hurling itself again. So it's the perseverance. Richard could have said, you know, a bad word, it, sod it, he could have said. I'm not going to bother with this article anymore. It's clearly rubbish. And you didn't. You persevered. And now, and it also is a point that I was going to make further down the line. But you think, Richard Palmcut? 
had an article rejected? Yes. Everybody can get articles rejected, but everybody can get them published. Sorry? Uh, but as you said, uh, sometimes it is expected of us to publish, and uh, just how long we have to wait for each and every feedback to, to come, actually, that, that is a lot of time. I will come to that. <laughs> I will come yeah. to that. Yes, it can be very tough when the feedback takes a very long time on coming, and I would explain why. So, I should talk about gyms now. About, yes, please do. Yeah. So we have a journal called Interdisciplinary Musicology, and we want everybody to work between humanities and sciences, which is a difficult threat. And for that reason, we get hardly any submissions, because um, we said in the guidelines, you must show that you're working between humanities and sciences. And because that's so hard to do, hardly anyone submits. And so you think the journals have the power, and the, and the researchers have no power, because they keep rejecting you. But in fact, it's the other way around. Um, the, this journal has no power. We're waiting for some improvement. <laughs> 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 I'm to our journal like this, right? Um, and then we made it easier because previously we said you must have two authors and one must be primarily humanities and one must be primarily sciences and that was just too hard. We, we sat for years waiting for people to submit. <laughs> and so now, now we do special issue after a conference and we're hoping after that gets going then people might start submitting normal articles. Is there something you want? No, no, that's absolutely great, yeah. but I'm thinking about the two of you who came in and were introduced to me as the musician and the psychologist. There you are, you have a journal <laughs> to submit to. <laughs> well, actually, uh, published in German, people from here, me and some musicologists, so not primarily. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had two. Yes, yes, and I published in it. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's, it's great. Okay, so what the process involves, doing the research, presenting it at a conference, identifying the appropriate journal. The next thing is reading the information for authors. That is really important, that you actually read the guidelines. And so inside, they're on the inside back cover of the hard copies of Music as DNCA, or you can go to the website now this is where I'm very glad I didn't say I need the internet and I'm going to take you to the website, but I made you a screenshot instead, and here it is. So this is the this is the, well this was the front page um, in February, but this so this is the so this is the front page, and when you go to the next page, it takes you there are hyperlinks, and that takes you to the submission guidelines, and. Here they are. So it's all very, very, very small here. But I'll tell you what it says. It says this journal is a member of the Committee on Publication Ethics. Please read the guidelines below, then visit the journal submission site to upload your manuscript. Please note that manuscripts not conforming to these guidelines may be returned. Now, when I first started publishing music, when I first started editing music as the MCA, I did actually turn round several submissions saying these aren't in, these, these don't adhere to the guidelines, please can you resend them. I've got a little bit more lax now because if it's comprehensible, if it pretty much adheres to the, um, to the guidelines, if it's, if it's reviewable, then I don't bother too much because it is going to be formatted in the end. But you have a head start if you submit the way the journal asks you to submit. And then it says, only manuscripts of sufficient quality that meet the aims and scope of Musicus DMCA will be reviewed. So it's really important that you know what the aims and the scope of the journal are. And the guidelines do tell you. It says, <laughs> as part, it says, there are no fees payable to submit or publish in this journal. This is really important. Now that fees for so-called open access have been brought in. If I publish in Frontiers in Psychology, my institution is looking at £1,000. So that's, what's that, €1,200? Other way around, eight, no, it isn't €1,200. Euros. 
And you can't include publication fees in your grant application if the research is funded. And I actually ran into serious trouble because my institution hadn't thought about open access fees. Big universities have got a fund. My little institution doesn't. So it's really important to know that if you're to just to check, and in this case, Musicus Giancia, you do not pay to submit. You pay to read by being a member of the society or by paying for a copy of an article that you want to read if you're not a member of the society or, you're not, or you can't read it in your institution library. But there are no fees for you to publish in it. There, are, there aren't any fees to publish in gyms. And there are no fees in, so, and there are no fees for music performance research, which was the journal I edited for a long time, which was peer reviewed, but online, and it appeared very, very, very periodically. Um, you know, we didn't manage more than once a year. And that was open because it needed to be open, we said, at both ends. And it's similar with, with gyms. So, um, as part of the submission process, you're requested to warrant that you are submitting your original work, that you have the right to the work, that you're submitting the work for first publication in the journal, and that it's not being considered for publication elsewhere, and has not already been published elsewhere, and that you have obtained and can supply all necessary permissions for the reproduction of any copyright works not owned by you. So, for example, if you wanted to publish a diagram that was in somebody else's paper or textbook, you would have to have their permission. Um, when I've published about singing research and I've wanted to publish um, the text of the lyrics, for example, I need to check with the, with the copyright holder that that's possible to do. Um, it actually happened that I was, an article was submitted to me earlier this week, last week, um, saying, <laughs> Um, would you consider this article? It is, I have published the preliminary stages in the proceedings, in conference proceedings, but that was only two and a half thousand words. The whole article is six and a half thousand words, mm. and 75% of it is new. We've done X, Y, and Z to make it different. I looked at the two submissions and I thought, yeah, this is all right. This is not a republication of the same of the same research. Same project but different research. So that's fine. I sent that out to review. But we have had an issue recently with preprints and Richard and Blanco I uh, don't Blanco you probably don't know I didn't send this out to everybody, I don't think. I've certainly asked for feedback on whether we should begin to accept preprints. Um, because people now do publish preliminary drafts on their own websites. But there is a problem with this, and the problem is blind review. And that's why Musicus Giancia has decided not to change its policy for the moment. We may revisit it in future, but for the moment, we have this requirement. So we have what do we publish? We have the aims and scope. We have the types of article and advice on writing your paper. Then we have the editorial policies, the peer review policy, policies on authorship, acknowledgements, funding, and the declaration of conflicting interests. Acknowledgements, funding, and declaration of, of conflicting interests all should be included in the paper. Then it tells you about the publishing policies, publish, the publication ethics, contributors publishing have been open access and author archiving. Now, publication ethics came up quite recently. I have a PhD student, just got her PhD, subject to actually minor typographical errors though there was one issue that was raised at her viva. So this is a 
student who is a practicing teacher of Dalcro's Eurythmics. Anybody here familiar with Dalcro's? Yes. yes, I can see some smiles. So she's one of the world experts in the field. And she came to me eight years ago and said, there are people writing their master's theses about me and my work. There are people writing their PhD theses about me and my work. But if I go to a conference, nobody wants to talk to me because I don't have a doctorate. I'm just somebody who does it. I would like to do a doctorate on my own work. I'd like to write about my own research. And so she has spent eight years, she's done it part-time, she's had some gaps, but it's an action research project with an enormous theoretical component, but she carried out observations and some very detailed interviews. Um, and, I mean, it's a wonderful piece of work. I was at her viva, I was her second supervisor, and I was at her viva, and she did a really great job and then after the examiners had decided they would give her, the, they would award the PhD, they said to her, almost as she was about to leave, you know, your interviewees gave their permission to be interviewed eight years ago, some of them. I mean, five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago. And they also said they didn't want to be anonymous. Are you sure that they are still happy to be named in the thesis, particularly as some of the material they are sharing is very personal to them? And the chair of the FIVA committee said, oh well, Jane's the chair of the ethics committee at the RNCM, she'll make sure everything is done properly. And so I said to Karen, this is really a question of, first of all, courtesy in the case of the thesis, which is going to be in the public domain. But when it comes to publication, then you need to look at what the Committee on Publication Ethics says. And I found the clause that says that People who are interviewed, and particularly if they're not anonymous, have got to give their explicit permission at the time of publication. So there's an awful lot in the publication ethics <coughs> material that is well worth reading, even if you think, oh, I'm never going to do un anything unethical. You may find that a student does or the author of an article that you're reviewing. So it may well be something that comes up. And then at the bottom, you've got how to prepare your manuscript, how to format it, what to do about artwork and other features, what you might want to do about supplementary material. So sometimes a video, you might want to, you might want to include, and you can with this because the NCA, you might want to include audio material or video material. Um, I just sent an article out for review this morning before I came, um, and I noticed at the bottom that they're at the bottom of the PDF of the proof of the of, of the draft. I mean, of, yes, of the draft. There was a note that said there is material here that can't be um, made a, into a PDF. It's an MP3 file. So I have to make a note that when I send it out to review, I have to send the link to it as well. Um, supplementary material, reference style, and then something that I think may be very important to some of you, the use of an English language editing service. Because although Music of CNCA used to publish in French and German <coughs> and, and uh, Spanish, I think, now it only publishes in English and I know that it's a really big ask for people for whom English is not their first language but it does have to be written in idiomatic, comprehensible English. So, I didn't, wasn't expecting to go through this in quite such detail but I am absolutely 100% sure 
that even Blanca and Anna and you sitting in the front row can't see what this says. But, it, but when you go to it on the website, I will already have talked you through it. So you need to format your article correctly. And as of the 1st of November, which is to all intents and purposes now, you want to go to the APA 7th edition. Now, this is where I'm sorry that I haven't got a link. I can't take you here. I didn't make screenshots because there are lots of them. But it's a brilliant website. It's really clear. There are resources that you can download. There are sample papers. There's one for students and there's one for professionals. There's one that's annotated, there's one that isn't annotated. And there are lots of guidelines and lots of kind of quick fixes. You don't have to buy the whole manual. Though, I will tell you that I have sent off for a copy because I think it's just going to be invaluable. In fact, the changes from the, seventh, from the sixth to the seventh edition are not so great. But you can submit in Calibri. You don't have to use Times New Roman. <laughs> you don't have to put two spaces after a full stop, what Americans call a period. Okay. <laughs> what else did I notice? I mean, that, that, it's crazy. I mean, they're, they're just, they're really little things. Um, I did have, I looked at the citations and references those are essentially the same. And there's a lot more guidance on the new kinds of media that people are citing. So um, it, it, it's real, but the website, I'm, I'm just going to say, the web, I've got nothing to do with the APA, I've only just registered, but it's a real, I was really impressed at just how user-friendly it is. Has anybody, has anybody else looked at it? Richard, have you looked at it I yet? I looked at the latest one. Right, okay. Well, it doesn't... Uh, Musica Sciencia is going to start using it from the 1st of November, and it was Sage who contacted me and said, you probably want to have a, have a quick read of this. And so I thought, oh, that's good. That's something new I can share with you. You will submit your, the de your, your author details, your abstract and your full text on separate documents. And this is really important because when an article is submitted to Musica Sciencia, the first thing that I have to do is what's called the admin checklist. And it's only got two things, two boxes for me to tick. And one of them is, is the manuscript acceptable in terms of its formatting and the um, figures, tables and so on? And the second one, is it original? And that's the first thing I do. And only then does the, um, does the system produce a PDF that has on it the abstract on the front page. That's what <coughs> goes to reviewers. And then the rest of it is the full text, which begins with the abstract. I, it's, oh, I'm sorry. Is it original? And is it, is it anonymous? That's the important thing, that it doesn't have the author details on it. Because when it goes out to reviewers, the reviewers don't know who the author is and vice versa. Okay. You want to send a list of your figures and tables and send the figures and tables on a separate page. I know it's irritating um, when, you're, when you're preparing your article mm. and when you're sending it to your colleagues um, and your supervisor and to students to read, you want to have all the tables and the figures inside as though they were reading it, but you need to extract them for the purposes of submitting to the journal. And then you submit online through the author portal, and I'm not going to show you that. And you send a cover letter in which you say, it's original, I haven't submitted it anywhere else, um, 
I, I, I've got the copyrights, and so on. And you also say what new information you are bringing to the field. And if you're very kind, you will also submit a list of potential reviewers. And as I say, you can submit supplementary materials. So, what happens next? What do you think happens next? You've submitted it. What do you think happens next? <laughs> oh, Blanca, in your dream. <laughs> what happens What happens, or more, what happens before it's published? What's the first oh. thing that has to happen? Waiting. <laughs> From your point of view, you're waiting. Okay. Now, what do you think happens to the article? While you're waiting, what do you think's happening? Because it's waiting in the list of the other articles. When you're well, yes, but what happens before that? This is actually the most important point. Think back to what this talk is called. It's called sharing your research. To be sure that, that it's really uh, uh, right. It's arrived. It, it's arrived. It arrives in the website. You've put it. You've sent it off into the ether. You've pressed the button that says submit, right? And you think it just goes into a cloud, into a into an eye cloud somewhere. It doesn't. It arrives in my inbox, <laughs> and I read it. I read it. If Richard sent his article to seven editors who read the article. Every paper that I've ever published was read by someone. And I knew the name of that person because they were on the cover of the journal. You are writing your research for someone to read. You are sharing your research. And that actually is the most important point that I want to send, send you home with. Somebody is going to read your article. You're not writing it because you have to, because of the ref, because of the job. You're reading it, you're writing it so that somebody can read it. Further down the line, that somebody is going to be somebody like you. The first time that you open a journal, you know, a copy of a journal, or you click on the, you download it, and you click on it, and you read it. Somebody is going to read it like you're going to read it, and that first person is me. Okay. Now, what do you think happens after that? No, no, no. <laughs> All right. I admit it. Sometimes I read it the way I do a first draft of a not very good student's not very good chapter. I have this little think bubble that goes, how much more of this rubbish do I have to read? <laughs> but everybody feels like that. And at least if you're a reader, you can say, I don't need to read any more of this rubbish. But I do read it all. And then... I f and I already know, pretty early on, if I think it's potentially publishable. And I'm actually already thinking, who can I send this to? Now, the article that arrived this morning, actually, it was rather off-putting, because nobody's ever done this before, but for some reason, every reference, every mm. citation, every in-text citation, had been picked out in red and it hadn't, been, it hadn't been put back in black. So I felt as though I was reading an article that I was already reading that had hyperlinks. Oh, and if I got an article that was in two columns, I would really, ugh, I would be tearing my hair out. Please don't do that. Um, so by the time I had read, and it's not, and this article I got this morning was so much not in my field. And I thought, so my first thought was, ooh, uh, am I going to be able to get away with this, uh, with rejecting this out of hand? But I could see almost immediately 
that it was going to be of interest to a particular group of researchers. And I could see from the citations, I was already thinking, oh, she's been cited, maybe she could review it. Or so-and-so has been cited, maybe they could review it. By the time I got to the end of the second page, I thought, yes, this is a manuscript that I am definitely sending out to review. So if I think it's potentially publishable, <laughs> I will send it to two reviewers. Now, I may think that it's potentially publishable, but it needs more work. Now, this happened about three days ago. I got an article um, by somebody for whom English was not just not their first language, but very, very clearly not their first language. I'm now trying to remember what the article was about. And I, and I started reading it thinking, mm, is, this really, is this really right for me as a Kiskiensie? And then I thought, actually, I think it might really be of interest to people. But I don't know who I would want to send it to in this state. Because anybody I send it to who is an native English speaker is going to come back and say the English needs improving. So with this author, I didn't just unsubmit it. I wrote saying, I think your article has the potential to be published, but not yet. The first thing to do is to get it into more idiomatic English. Now, you have a choice. SAGE recommends English language editing services, but actually Musica Scienciae has a discount arrangement for people who want to publish in Musica Scienciae. And so sometimes I will send a flyer for that particular service and say I would recommend that you make use of this one. Actually, this author has one English, one, one in, you know, English speaking author, there are three authors, and the third author is in fact an, in, an academic working at an English university. So I, wrote, so I wrote to the author saying, my first suggestion is that you ask the third author to, um, to, to have a good look at it before you resubmit it. With your permission, I will unsubmit the article so that I don't have to reject it. If I unsubmit it, then it means that you submit it again as a first, you know, as a first draft. And I also said, and I often do this now, I didn't used to, but I've learned how to do this. I say, and if you'd like to send it to me personally first, I'll let you know whether it's now suitable for submission. So there is that kind of, that, 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 I'm working on the basis of giving the benefit of the doubt. The problem is, and I have explained this to authors that I've worked with quite closely, if I get an article that is in perfect English, I can, t I can make an assessment right away if it's, a, if it's a bad article, if I want to reject it, if I want to reject it, and I, and I have a good idea if it's a good article or if it's a bad article. If the English isn't very good, sometimes I can tell that it's a good article, but, it would be, but it's going to have to be in better English further down the line. And sometimes I can't tell whether, whether it would be any good because the language is such that I just don't understand. Okay? So that's why it is really worth your while getting it into as good English as possible. That does not mean academic English, necessarily. If you have read articles that were very difficult to understand, you can bet your bottom dollar, you can be sure that 
the article has not been well written. If you have read articles that you really enjoyed reading and that you found easy to read, that's good writing. That's the writing you want to model your writing on. And I will tell you, because he isn't here to blush, but John Sloboda was my PhD supervisor. I read his work long before I went to work with him. And everything, almost everything I've learned about writing, I've learned from him because he writes really clearly and not in a way as to put people off. I'm going to use a long words here, deliberately. I call it writing in a way that is willfully obfuscatory. <laughs> it's a way of, in English we say, pulling the wool over somebody's eyes, making it sound as though you know more than you actually do. Just try putting it into ordinary English. And I'm sorry if I'm really kind of ramming this home. It's very unfair. You know, I have, I have no words of Serbian. I have one word of Serbian. Okay, I have learned to say Havala. It's the only thing I can say. Because every other word has been, every other word I might know, has been um, pushed out by the small amount of Russian that I know. So I apologise for that. And for me to write an article in Serbian would be as unthinkable as for me to fly with my <laughs> arms to the moon. And I am asking you to write in idiomatic English. I apologise for that, but it's an English language journal. So you have to make the effort. Ooh. Right. So I've said between a half and two thirds of all submissions are, re are rejected outright. Actually, I've done the stats again, and I'm going to show them to you. They're on my next slide. And this is the point where I'm going to explain your waiting. Okay, because reviewers are asked to review within four weeks, but they often take longer. So I will tell you what happens. I say, I say blithely, if I think your article is publishable, I send it to two reviewers. Now what actually happens is, I send it to two reviewers, one of them is unavailable and the other one declines. They are supposed to suggest alternate <coughs> reviewers. So I send to the two alternate reviewers, they are unavailable and they decline. They don't send any alternate reviewers. I write to them saying, could you suggest alternate reviewers? And they, and they, and they all write back, this has happened, they all recommend the other three that have already, <laughs> that have already declined. So at this point, I write to you, the author, and I say, I'm running into some trouble here. Um, you didn't suggest any reviewers. Do you think you could send me a list of reviewers? Okay? And so, and so then we go through the whole thing. And it can go round, it can go down eight, nine, ten reviewers. That's the first thing. I am pretty good about turning things round because, you know, I'm like a rat in a behavioural experiment. I respond to stimuli, and the stimulus is MS190070 is in your inbox. And I don't like that, I flag it, then it turns red. I don't like that. I go into my inbox I, and I do what I need to do to get it to, you know, to get that to do off my list. And then but reviewers can take time to decline. They get reminders. They can take time to say they're unavailable. They get reminders. And so, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that's what you're waiting for. You are usually waiting for the reviewers to say they're going to do it, and then for the reviewers to actually do it. Okay. Now, I'm currently having, I will tell you the story of an article that was submitted months and months and months ago too late for a special issue, um, and too long, because it was only supposed to be six and a half thousand words and it came in at about 20,000. 
and it had in the end been accepted, but then the English was terrible, so I sent it back. Now that person has supposed to be being reviewing an article for me for months, and is hanging on to the review until I get back with my comments on the most recent draft of, of their manuscript. And I have been saying, look, I'm really sorry, but I've got a deadline. I've, I've, got, I've got a deadline. I've got two things that I have to do by the 23rd of October. One of them is give this conference talk in Belgrade. And the other is to submit a grant application and everything is on hold until, until I've submitted the grant application and written the lecture, written the keynote, which I now have done. So in fact, I'm now back on the case and that author is back on the case reviewing the article. But that's, that's I've kept in touch with the author to let them know what's going on. And I've also given them the option to withdraw the article and to send it somewhere else. But, all right, so that's why all of the waiting. I promise you, it's not the editor-in-chief. Um, until we get to the point where the editor-in-chief has said, please could you send me the all but final draft before you submit the final draft so that I can accept it and it'll go into the system and go into production. Sometimes I'm slow on that because it's hard work. That's the real editing. So, I said I would do the stats this morning. So, I've dealt with um, 112. I've done, so, I started the September before last. So, I'm up to number 112. And of those, 21 are accepted. It's not a very high proportion. Some of those are already... The, the, none, none of the articles that I have accepted are in print yet. Why not? because my predecessor, Reinhard Kapitz, is a brilliant editor, and, you know, I, I, just fantastic, really, really good. And what he did so marvellously was to get so many submissions that there was a backlog of about 100, which means there's more than a year's worth of articles that are waiting to go into print and that are still coming out in print. Articles in Musica Scientia get published quite quickly online. Once they've been accepted, then they are available on online first. They are published. You can put them on ResearchGate. You can put them in your repository. Um, they are published. So, I've, so out of those, in that year and a bit, I've accepted 21 so far. Um, I've got 16 that are currently in review. So they're either, it's either after the first... Um, either for the first time or after a first revision. I'm I was surprised to see what proportion I've rejected after the first revision. Personally, I think it's quite cruel to ask somebody to do a second revision and then reject. Mm. I would rather it only had two rounds of reviews and then was accepted. But I don't know. I mean, Richard, have you had the experience of something going to more than going more than oh, two rounds? That's a really tough one. Yeah, I'm not sure what to do either. I think every case you have to look at and make a kind of subjective decision. So you're saying the reviewers want to reject the revision, or you want to? Reject yes. The sometimes the reviewers will say, "No, I, you know, you still haven't done enough." Yeah. Um, now, the, the the largest category is off the desk reject. And that's the case where you don't get the lovely feedback. Where I will read an article and I will be able to see pretty much immediately that it's not the right article for the journal. And it's as simple as that. It's a question of fit. It's not that it was a bad article, but rather that it's not right for the aims and scope of the journal. So, um, and that's just, a, and that's to save the time of the reviewers to whom I might otherwise have sent it. And I didn't desk reject when I first took over. I think it took me about three months to realize that it was probably kinder to desk reject 
um, from from the you know from the outset. So that's where I will make the decision. And if that happens to you, chalk it up to experience. Send it to the next journal on the list. But, but yes, but surely you get um, you, surely you reject stuff because it's just bad. That it's inside the scope of the journal and it's just not good. Right? Well, yes, but I wanted to kind of I didn't want anybody in this room to think that I think that any of you are capable of writing bad <coughs> journal articles. But it's quite true. I do has to do it, right? so yes, somebody it has to, but since yeah. I feel I'm, you know, I'm addressing anybody who's looking at me and smiling at me, the more smiles I get and the more looks I get, the more I'm doing, the more I'm thinking, neither of you who I'm looking at, <laughs> you, it's not that you've sent a bad article. Yes, sometimes you get shockers. <laughs> I'm not, 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 not um, divulging any names um, of the. So and so far, I've I've done this kind of unsubmit um, in ten cases, which actually again is more than I thought I thought that it was. There are a couple of examples. There are a couple of cases where um, authors have opted to withdraw, usually where I've just got too involved. Um, and you know, it's 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 going to it's. I, we can see we're not getting anywhere, and the author says, "Okay, that's it. I'll send it somewhere else." Um, and so, and at the moment, I've currently got seven seven that are being, that are being revised. Um, so I just thought you'd like that snapshot. I don't get, and I've I I thought about telling you what the kind of scale is of turnaround. Um, what I can tell you, it's a little bit like what I say to PhD students, I personally have never had the experience of, as a supervisor, I've never had the experience of a PhD student being awarded their PhD without corrections. I've examined 26 PhDs now, I've never awarded without corrections. I do know two people whose PhDs were awarded without corrections, but it is so rare. I mean, it, it can happen, but it's very, very, very rare. And I've never had the experience of sending an article out to review and both reviewers coming back saying, accept with no revisions. I've had, I have, I, I have actually had the experience of having a paper accepted without revisions twice, twice. <laughs> and in both cases, I wrote back to the editor and said, are you absolutely sure? Was this not a mistake? And they said no. And so all I could think was, well, I suppose I had exerted all my editing experience on you know, making sure that the papers were as good as they possibly could be. But, you know, you've, you've got to work on the basis that no matter how good it is, somebody's always going to spot something that you haven't thought of. So that's the kind of the very, very best case scenario. Just don't, ex don't expect it. Your, your best case scenario is that two reviewers will come back and say minor revisions. Now, I'm also trying to make my way towards a strategy when I get one reviewer who says um, they want substantial revisions and another one who says reject. And I'm slowly moving to the position where if I've got one reject and one substantial revisions, it's kinder to say to the author, it's a reject. But this is the feedback that you should use to don't be disheartened by the reject, use the feedback for reworking it and sending it elsewhere. I have once in a blue moon said revise it and send it back to us as a new submission. So that can happen as well. Where the reviewers are very much in disagreement, so major, major revisions, substantial revisions on the one hand, and minor revisions or accept without revisions on the other, that's much trickier and at that point I will seek a third review. And this happened again very recently. Um, 
Well, I think this was the story I was going to tell, but I've kind of preempted it with Rich. Well, Richard's preempted it with his story. But I had an article, uh, an article that is has been accepted and will appear, um, is by the student of somebody very, very, very eminent, looking at some aspect of the very, very eminent person's theory. And in fact, the very, very eminent person is a co-author of the paper. And one of the reviewers, who is equally eminent, rejected it. The other reviewer wanted minor revisions. So I asked for a revision to be made. And the first reviewer still wanted to reject it. And the second reviewer now wanted to accept it. So at this point, I looked for a third reviewer. And when the third reviewer said accept, I decided okay to accept. There are some still tweaks to do with the English, but that's in hand now. And I wrote very apologetically to the very eminent reviewer, who by this time had realized who the very eminent theorist was, and said, well, I was very well disposed to it once I realized that so-and-so was a co-author. Um, at this point, I wrote to the, to the reviewer and said, you may disagree with me. You know, I'm sorry if my strategy isn't the one that you would have taken, but this is the decision that I've taken. I mean, damn it all, I am the editor-in-chief. I'm allowed to make these decisions. But I said, this is the decision that I've come to. And you will see the other reviewers' comments when I send the formal acceptance letter. And that very eminent person, who I'm going to be seeing next week, um, wrote back to me very nicely, saying, I'm looking forward to seeing what they've got to say. And now on another matter, dirty, dirty, dirty. So it's really, I mean, you know, there are, there are, what I think I want to get over to you is, you may be working, you may have a co-author who is very well known, very highly respected, but that doesn't mean to say that the article is going, that the manuscript is going to be accepted. The process of review is double blind. They don't know who the reviewers are. The reviewers don't know who they are. They will make a decision on the basis of that paper and that paper alone. So, um, so, and you can be somebody that nobody has ever heard of. Everybody was once upon a time somebody that nobody had ever heard of. And you will get your, public, your paper published. Okay, so what happens next? The reviewers grade the submissions, they make a recommendation, they provide comments to the authors, I send an action message saying whether it will be accepted as it is or with revisions or if it's to be rejected. And if, it's, if your article has been accepted with revisions, you make them and you submit the revised article in two ways. You submit it with tracked changes and a letter detailing how you responded. And that's really, you know, and that's, that's really crucial. One good way to do it is to do it as a table. So you just so so in the left hand column you put the comments of the reviewers and in the right hand column you say how you how you revised it. Um, and that makes the reviewers' job very easy. And then eventually. So there you are. What happens next? The article is published. <laughs> the author is happy. And everybody is happy. And very far. So this is my last slide, um, and it's the summary. But what have I left out? Or shall we just go, we'll go on to questions? Yes, please. Maybe, uh, because I think there are a lot of students here. Yes. Uh, I think you didn't mention <laughs> reviewers who are not polite. Thank and you. This is a really big issue, because Thank you have you. to somehow, because my, my last experience is like that. Uh, for example, you said that, that, that my work is superficial, but sh he didn't or she didn't reject it. And my first reaction was anger, you know, because I'm re also a reviewer, yes. and I'm also very, I, I also sometimes get annoyed by things that somebody write it, write, wrote, but. Uh, Having that experience that I'm author as well, I'm putting some effort to be polite and to say something maybe impolite in polite manner. But 
I'm this. so glad you raised yeah. this, and Blanca raised this with me yesterday as well, and I did say I was going to, 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 to talk about this. You know, the, the emails that go to our reviewers have got a long, they've got guidelines, they have the reminder to be polite. I would say exactly, it can be summarised in exactly the same way that I've said what I've said to you as authors. You are writing for someone. Someone is going to read what you've written. When you write a review, you're writing it for the author to read. And so I would... I might think, how much more of this rubbish do I have to read? But never in a million years would I personally write it down and send it in a review. But not everybody reads the guidelines, not everybody reads, is, not everybody takes on board that they must not make what we call ad hominem or ad feminam remarks, personal remarks. When I used to teach undergraduate students psychology, I did so for 14 years with the Open University, which is distance learning. And so all the teaching, apart from monthly face-to-face -face tutorials, which are not compulsory, contact with students was pre, well actually when I was a student, when I was a psychology student, it was pre-email. You would send your assignment typed out in an envelope to the central office of the Open University where, and then it would be sent to the, to the tutor who was going to mark it and they would send their feedback back and you would get an envelope with your essay in it and their feedback, a carbon copy in pencil, but very difficult, very hard to read. When I became a tutor we were doing it electronically, we were doing it by email. But I used to do a whole seminar on what to do when your assignment comes back. And the answer was open it, take in the mark and then close it down and go away and don't think about it for an hour or two because actually getting feedback is, can be really painful. Musicians, you know, we know what it's like to be in a masterclass with somebody pulling apart our playing or our singing and they're doing it out loud and they're doing it in public. So you might think that you and I and Richard too, I think, we would have, we've, we've got, you know, any of us who have trained as musicians have had that experience and we ought to be inured to getting written feedback saying our research is superficial or the analyses were insufficient. I wasn't rejected, that was my, that was my, you know, some kind of concern and surprise, you know. I wasn't rejected. I was uh, between minor and major revisions, but still the language was like that. That was my dilemma. You know? What can I say? I'm not going to defend the person who reviewed you. I think it's. I think it's. I can think of all kinds of words. It's It's un. It's it's un. It's, it's, un, it's unnecessary and it's unkind. Jane, what do you do in that case if the reviewers? Do you know? Ooh, <laughs> I don't think I. I don't. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think I've ever done anything because I don't think anybody submitted a review that I didn't want to pass on to the reviewer. Uh, to the author, I'm sorry. I don't think I've, I don't think anybody submitted a review that I didn't think I could pass on to the reviewer. But if it did, 
I think what I would do is write back and say, do you think you could revise your review? Review, review. <laughs> Absolutely. Some editors some, sometimes, in my experience, uh, in that case, send some letter to the author as well. Yes. They want to uh, yes. yes. talk. To soften it. Yeah. Because, you know, Richard was saying, you think that the journal has all the power. No, it isn't. It's the authors who have the power. If they don't, but, so we don't want we don't want our authors to be upset with us. I have got some more stories, but I'm not going to tell them to you. Not now, anyway. <laughs> okay. So this is really important. The writing and submitting an article gives you the opportunity to receive feedback and the opportunity to make use of the feedback. The making use of the feedback is really important, and that's why you need to kind of distance yourself from it if it's unpleasant because there are going to be useful comments. Blanca, what did you say to me yesterday? I read what they wrote, I hated them, and a week later I realised that yeah, they were actually saying something useful. Then <coughs> you start reading. It See enables you to right. it, exactly. You you realise. You realise they're right. I am I, I am so grateful to the reviewers of my papers. There's, there's, there's absolutely no question. I can think in, in every case, I've never thought, hmm, they wanted me to do that all that, I suppose I have to do it. I've <laughs> always thought, why didn't I think of that in the first place? That's really helpful. Um, in some cases, it actually changes the whole thrust of, of, of an article. I, I wrote um, an article that came out of a conference paper, Richard, you'll remember this, the virtuosity conference. Um, I had added. There was. A, I'd written a sentence at the end in the limitations about my own views on virtuosity, or what had shaped my own views on virtuosity. And one of the reviewers said, "This was really interesting. I would like to know more about this. Could you put it at the beginning? Could it be? Could it be up front, as it were?" And what was so glorious was that it gave me the opportunity to dig in. It was, I'd learned it from my piano teacher. I wanted to know what had happened to my piano teacher. I googled him. I found, I couldn't remember the date, I remember the date of his birth but not the date of his death. I ended up being put in touch with one of his other former pupils who turned out to be absolutely fascinating. And it, it led to a whole, and then I started finding other publications that he had written. If it hadn't been for that critic, for that reviewer, who had said, could we have a little bit more about this? There's a whole, there's a whole kind of chunk of um, fascinating material I wouldn't otherwise have known, and it was personally of great interest to me as well. Okay, so that's really the important thing about submitting articles for publication. It gives you this possibility of actually becoming an active member of the research community. And that, that, there's just that one last slide. There we go. And you know what? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They said to Manka, I've only got about 20 minutes worth of material. <laughs> but I think we can probably, you know, with interaction, we can probably, we can, we can probably film an hour, an hour and a half, all right. We did, didn't we? Thank you very much indeed for all of your contributions. It was so motivating that now I have a great, uh, a huge need to go to my room and try to... <laughs> <laughs> well, please, I look forward, when I, when I start receiving articles from Serbia, I won't remember any of your names, and I will, and I will just be. But please remind me. We'll send our photos. <laughs> <laughs> I would like that very much. So after this workshop, we will think, well, what will James think of this? <laughs> well, it's in exactly the same way. I think the very first paper I ever submitted, I didn't know how to submit a paper. I didn't know how to submit a paper, and I wrote to the editor and said, would you be interested in my paper on? And he wrote back and he said, this isn't, he said, this actually isn't the way to go about things. He was very, very nice about it, but he said, this isn't, this isn't the way to go about things. You're supposed to submit it in a formal kind of way. Um, 
But I think about him a lot. Um, it was Graham Welch, who's, who is um, um, head honcho. He's the, he's the kind of the big guy at the top of Sempre, our national. He's Blanca, actually. He's the, he's the British Blanca. Um, <laughs> but, oh, I can't say any of these things. Much older. And um, it doesn't have as much hair. <laughs> well, and actually, he was here in September. He's a lovely man. He's a lovely man. And he was very, very kind. But you know, here is a piece of advice. There are editors you can write to and say, would you be, if, you're, if you think, will this be appropriate, you can write to the editor and say, would you be interested in my article on such and such. And it, again, it happened yesterday. And I looked at it and I thought, would we? And then I thought, well, why not? Submit. Let's see what it's like. And so I wrote, saying, yes, by all means, please submit it through the portal. So you can <coughs> write. You're writing to... Th that's, that's the bottom line. You're writing to a person. You're writing for people. And you will be getting feedback from people. And all I can hope is that the person who wrote saying your work was superficial had got out of bed the wrong side that morning. Or maybe they had just had a paper rejected themselves. <laughs> so people were human it happened the same with Blanca. After a few days, he or she, she was right completely. With her, his <laughs> or her I you added. <laughs> you realize, yes. But it is important. Yes, I realize that this superficial actually <laughs> in some cow. But will be meaningful to somebody who reads it. I mean that's the other thing. I mean the sad it used to be said that the number of people who actually read your paper was vanishingly small. With the internet that's no longer the case. And you know that now lots of people will read your work if it's in if if it's if it's a growing field as it often is. And if it isn't, then you're going to be the pioneer and people a long time into the future will come back and say, aha, so and so was thinking about that 10 years ago or whatever. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. For any of you who are around, I mean, I'm going to be around over the next three days. So... Please come and talk to me. And if I look at you blankly, just remind me you.